All right, welcome back, friends and comrades. Very, very excited to welcome a special guest today for a conversation on the great proletarian cultural revolution in China, which was a 10-year period of history, uh, a sequence of events, which has uh, really, I think, baffled uh, both Marxists and non-Marxists alike, and which has generated uh, some puzzles regarding how we are to approach uh, emancipatory or revolutionary politics in our time. And uh, so, welcome to Tony of One Dime, uh, which is a very popular YouTube channel. How are you today? Great. Thank you for having me. I'm definitely very happy to be on this podcast because I listen to it quite frequently, and I really like the conversation you did with Derek Varn. You know, I, I look up to both of you, so it's certainly you know great for a student of the game to meet one of the uh, teachers of the game. Yeah, no, it's uh, likewise. I mean, you're you have two channels. We've developed two channels. One is your own podcast, and the other is a sort of video experimental educational platform called One Dime. And I will link to it. Um, a number of conceptual videos that you've made over the years. Tony has a lot of sort of skills in video editing, apparently and obviously. So everyone needs to check all of that out. And what I was motivated here was two things. The first is an essay that you wrote for this collection, which I happen to have made a contribution to as well, uh, from Theory Underground. The title of the book is called Underground Theory. And as a side point, it was quite, quite funny. Uh, a lot of people had a bit of a hysterical reaction to the publication of this book for a couple of reasons. One is there were a few anti-woke authors. I myself am not an anti-woke person, and I don't think Tony is either. Um, although that I think elements of the critique of woke um, have some merit, but I would never... I would never use or incorporate that language because I think it backfires and it's mis it misunderstands and it's just, let's say it's problematic. Um, but because I support Theory Underground, our friend Dave, in his efforts to do public education for the working class, I decided to make a contribution to the essay. But anyways, when I posted about it, I don't know if you saw on, um, on Twitter, people were quite upset. Um, the most interesting reason that they were upset about this book, Underground Theory, by the way, is because people don't believe or have a hard time conceptualizing what the meaning of underground is, right? In other words, people were saying, who are you to say you're underground, right? Uh, it's kind of pompous, right? Like, uh, <laughs> it's relative. Like, there maybe was a time in the 20th century where some authority could say and point to a movement and call that in a bona fide sense underground. But I felt that people were hystericized by this. They're saying, wait a second. And what, so what that revealed, Tony, and I want you to take on this, is that we, we've lost all bearing on the clarity of this, of this idea of what is underground. So that, that was an interesting observation. I don't know if you have any thoughts. Yeah, it seemed people were mad about it, mainly for the anti-woke post-left association. Yeah. I would I would actually say that I am anti-woke, but I would say I'm not post-left and I'm not anti-left. Whereas, you know, there's a fine line, I think, between people like us who might critique aspects of woke culture versus people who use that to kind of Trojan horse right-wing talking points or maybe be just simply seduced by right-wing talking points. But yeah, as you mentioned, people were also quite annoyed by the fact that Slavoj Žižek was headlining it and some more known authors. So they were like, this is not underground theory. But I mean, the whole point was right to boost no names like myself and Dave and all the other people. I wouldn't I would say you're you're definitely not a no name. You're like, you know, obviously not as known as Slavoj, but you're definitely more known as an author than the underground yeah. people. Yeah. Well, putting that to the side, that's a little background. <laughs> Um, let us turn to the conversation at hand. We are only going to touch the surface today. Um, we are trying to unravel some issues in the West that I think in particular have been cloudy for a lot of analysts, whether you are analyzing the proletarian cultural revolution in China, which really kicked off in 1966 and ended 10 years later, very close to the, to the time of the death of Mao Zedong. Um, 
part of what we want to do here, Tony, is also just inform people that don't have much understanding of what actually went down. So I will ask you to just retell some things. But also I want to analyze the, the content of your second video. I encourage everyone to watch both videos that you published. And you published these just a couple months ago, pretty recently. Um, and I'll link to them. You know, that, that question of the legacy, of the consequences, of the meaning of Leninist, quote unquote, Leninist politics, which Mao, of course, was always keeping at the center of his intentions, of his activity, even despite the fact that Mao will um, go beyond so many core presuppositions of, of, of Leninism, particularly around uh, Mao's understanding of socialism itself um, and of class struggle itself. Um, so could we start by you telling us the predominant stereotypes that exist about the history of the great proletarian culture revolution in China? Sure. First, I will start off, though, by saying what, how those videos came about. And as you alluded to, um, the videos that I did, one is the first documentary, which is on really what happened in the uh, Chinese Cultural Revolution, where I really try to tell it chronologically, but also in a way that was nonpartisan. So people generally liked it on the left because I clearly wasn't a Maoist, so I wasn't portraying it in a very biased way, but I'm also very, uh, certainly not an anti-communist. So I really wanted to simply just understand what happened which made me a good candidate to do that. But the reason why I did that was because there is no good video on the Cultural Revolution on YouTube at the moment. If you look up the matter, generally, you'll see there are six-minute videos trying to give a very quick meta-narrative about what happened that's very oversimplified. And the only reason I would undertake such a difficult project, which is telling one of the most complicated, bewildering events of all time, I think, is simply because I had done that research beforehand for that article you mentioned, which was called Totalitarianism or Anarchy, the Contradictions of Anti-State Politics in the Mao's Cultural Revolution. So I had written that essay originally for my mentor at the time when I was in grad school, Assad Haider, who you might be aware of. I would consider one of the most brilliant people I've ever studied with. And he, he quite liked the essay, and I, I added to it since. I ended up publishing it through the Underground Theory volume. Now, as you might notice, that essay is structured quite differently from the video. The video is retold chronologically with the more basic details for people who wouldn't otherwise know about the event, whereas the article assumes some knowledge on behalf of the reader. So I guess to answer your first question, just simply, what do people get wrong? I mean, I would suggest people simply watch the video if... <laughs> To, to really understand. But the key thing that people get wrong is the framing of the event. They think that it was orchestrated from the top down by Mao Zedong, the great dictator, and the Red Guards were just these sort of automaton followers of Mao who did as he pleased, and he wanted to win a power struggle within the party. And he just got these Red Guards to rebel and reestablish power and reestablish a totalitarianism of sorts, and they also focus on the culture aspect of the Cultural Revolution, which certainly was a feature of it. But they try to really focus on the fact that the Cultural Revolution wanted to change people and make them more communist by force. But what they miss, however, is that the Cultural Revolution is, in many ways, a bottom-up phenomenon that is inspired, provoked from the top, but not controlled by the top, by uh, Mao and the uh, Cultural Revolution Group, the CCRG. What people get wrong is the framing, and uh, the Cultural Revolution, in many ways, I view it as a phenomenon of mass democracy, of mob justice. Now, some people, like uh, your mentor, Alain Badiou, have written about this in his essay, The Cultural Revolution, The Last Revolution. He has called it an expression of anti-state politics, uh, in that he had a great trust in the mass to operate and build communism outside of the state. Now, while Badiou... Uh, I actually agree with his characterization of the Cultural Revolution. He tends to see this as some sort of blueprint for something better than Leninism. 
I'm deeply skeptical of that. In fact, the implication of the article was that, if anything, the Cultural Revolution has more lessons for people on the sort of libertarian left, the anarchist left, people who assume that the problem is bureaucracy, the problem is state control only, and that if you merely give power to the people to develop communism spontaneously, you know, you, you wouldn't have these sort of problems. Now, I think Mao is right to diagnose, as many people after him were, the problems of the Soviet Union, bureaucratization, all of that. However, I think the fact that the Cultural Revolution ended up the way it did is it, it's, it's something that shouldn't just be taken for granted or blamed on Mao. Man. It's mm. something that is an expression of the risks, I believe, of mass rebellions. Because one thing I try to really point out over and over again in both videos was that the Red Guard factions, who, as we know, you know the, the Red Guards were these students, but also workers ended up joining them. And they emerged spontaneously, but Mao, of course, gave support to them, and they sort of become his followers. But they turn on each other, they end up in a factional warfare where everyone is claiming allegiance to Mao Zedong thought and true communism and anti-revisionism, but they end up turning against each other. But before that, you do see this blossoming of radical experimentation, which Mao very much promoted. Institutions outside of the state, you know, collectives, different forms of proletarian organization. You see this really radical, you know, elements of the Paris Commune, famously the, the Shanghai Commune, of course. But what people forget, right, is this didn't destruct by, by the state. It actually self-destructed through the factional warfare. You had factions go to war with each other, and almost what well, was really only less than, less than, much less than two years, really a year of blossom, you know, blossoming of radical organization sort of devolved into this sort of carnage of what we you know, know as the Cultural Revolution, which is a mixture of, well, war warfare. But even during the great blossoming periods, there were elements of what we could call today cancel culture, yep. but in a much more serious form, people getting humiliating each other, getting in these little mob justice, doing, doing acts of mob justice, such as voting if someone's a revisionist and that they should be subject to a struggle session where they would be subject to really whatever the, the crowd decided. It could be something as simple as wearing a dunce cap or, you know, telling, admitting your mistakes, or it could be something as severe as, you know, being beaten in public or having to strip naked in front of people. Like all, all kind, it right. really varied. So I'm trying to say the horrors of the Cultural Revolution were actually mostly inflicted by the people themselves. It wasn't, you know, right. akin to the Stalinist purges. Something very different here. So that's the point, really. I'm trying to get across, and that's not to take a sort of conservative position and simply say, you know, the, the mass, the human nature is just doomed and communism sure. can't work. But rather that I think there are risks in human behavior, in mass organization, mass politics that can't just be dismissed as old liberal and conservative fuddy-duddy nonsense. I think there's some wisdom to end up returning to a lot of the classical liberals who I tend to be quite critical of such as John Stuart Mill, Tocqueville, who feared of the tyranny of the mass, the tyranny of mm -hmm. the majority. I used to always dismiss that as an expression of bourgeois ideology, but mm -hmm. I think there's an element of truth in it. And okay. that socialists need to figure out how to prevent the dictatorship of the proletariat from becoming a dictatorship over the proletariat or a cannibalization of the proletariat in the same right. way that the bourgeoisie sought to check the bourgeoisie as well as the proletariat through things like checks and balances and in institutions, right. like the founding fathers of America. That's why I think it's interesting of them, about them. They wanted to check their own power of their own class. And I think that's something we forget as Marxists, communists. We tend to think, well, you know, proletarian power over the dominant classes. But we forget that, okay, well, what if the dominated classes dominate each other? And that's sort of the message yeah. of the second video. And yeah, they get, yeah, put a long story short. That's very good. No, that's that's really helpful. Um, I want to go back to the origins of the outbreak of um, the Cultural Revolution by looking at a couple of phenomena that interest me. And Alessandro Russo, the Italian specialist, has written on this. 
And one of them is the fact that in a certain way, you could think about the evolution of communism in China at that moment in the late 60s, 65, 66, uh, as a problem of what Rousseau calls the socialist factory. And he says that one of the things that was recognized by the Chinese Communist Party at that time was that within the factory, uh, modes of fetishism still permeated sociality, let's say, amongst the workers. And so you had the kind of um, lack of clarity or rather the ambiguity of what it means for the socialist factory and the working class to truly transcend uh, this fundamental Marxist uh, problem of the constitution of collective social reality. And there's that phenomenon. There's also the phenomenon, which happened around this time as well and, and later, of, of Mao introducing a collective call, a call in a very broad sense for study on the concept of dictatorship a proletariat. Now, that is fascinating to me because if we return to the origins of Mao's movement from when he was young, it actually started, as I like to say, as a modest study group. And here he is making a call for study at a scale which is unprecedented and is almost unfathomable. So you have to admire that from a certain egalitarian point of view, an intellectual point of view, right? And that openness of intellectual engagement and understanding of, ma of the role of the masses as an agency, as a force for the realization of Marxist practice. Um, this is why I think for all of Mao's faults, uh, every Marxist has to have some reverence for this type of boldness and courage that he introduces. Can you speak about that, about those two dynamics of this question of, and this is very much related to the Shanghai Commune, of the problem of the uh, socialist factory and this how how the Red Guards sought to resolve this problem? And then also perhaps could you speak to the question of the dictatorship of proletariat? Yeah, sure. There's a lot of things there to uh, get into. Yeah, But I, I, like, know you, I know you can do it. I know you can do it. Sure. Well, as you mentioned, the uh, writer Alessandro Russo in his book, Cultural Revolution and Revolutionary Culture, uh, writes extensively about this. And I, he cited it all over the essay, which I wrote in Underground Theory. And I deal with him more directly in the second video on the, where I give my analysis of the Cultural Revolution, whereas the first video as I mentioned, is more of a impartial, at least as much as possible, telling of the story of the Cultural Revolution. So Alessandro Russo, yeah, he points out a lot of things that you mentioned, like that Mao, years before his death, shortly before his death, was doing a study group on evaluating the dictatorship of the proletariat. He wanted to study the consequences of the Cultural Revolution. What did it achieve? What had gone wrong? Deng Xiaoping would be a great obstacle to this. And uh, Deng Xiaoping would oppose this and who, who Mao let back into power. Because let's remember, Mao Zedong is not you know, the archetypical Stalinist that he's portrayed to be, a sort of hater of disagreement. Mao was, I wouldn't quite say pluralist, but he certainly respected his party comrades in a, in a way that you don't see with Stalin. Mao would bring people who he disagreed with back into power to really figure out solutions, because Mao himself, he didn't have the answers. He was bewildered by the Cultural Revolution, but he saw this as sort of an experiment, and an experiment in a sort of next stage beyond the Leninist party form. So that sort of gets into your question about the socialist factory. Of course, it's been known after the fall of communism, that, and even before, you have a lot of critiques of actually existing state socialism, and that the owner, the model of state ownership 
being the end all be all of communism is not really, some say not true communism at all, or just not a good form. You have critiques on the of Trotskyists on one side. You also have anarchists. You also have the whole socialism or barbarism in France, like, you know, Claude Lafour and all that. You have all sort of different Castoriadis, of course, who ends up rejecting Marxism. But yeah, there's all sort of angles one can critique. We sort of know a little, it seems obvious to us today that state ownership of everything is not an ideal form of socialism. But for Mao being a Leninist in a party who believed that the state was the party, that's why I use the term party state, people often use the word party state when referring to communist countries, because there was no separation between party and state, unlike uh, liberal, liberal quote-unquote democracies. So to say that socialism could be built by the masses outside of the party and that, in fact, they should challenge the party, was very radical because to question the party at the time was to question the proletariat. They were the representative. So Mao, he has a quote somewhere, and actually says it after the Cultural Revolution, after the mass phase, where socialist factories and capitalist factories have no difference other than who owns them. And what he's really saying is a critique that you know, is all too obvious to us today, which is that Soviet Union may have changed the ownership over the means of production, but not the relations of production. They may have shared a socialist form of distribution, but not a socialist form of production. And uh, there's, a, of course, a long tradition of this sort of critique. I, I, I would agree with it, right? But I think the solutions to it aren't super obvious. Well, let me say I, one quick thing. Yeah, I'm not sure thing. exactly if you want my opinion on this, because I, you know, I don't have I wouldn't say definitive. Well, I think, I think in a certain way, one of the ways for folks that know very little about the Chinese Cultural Revolution to sort of enter into its problem, right, is the distinction between socialism and communism in some way. Because a lot of more like, let's say, like Jacobin readers or sort of um, people today in the West, in America, who are disaffected with liberal progressivism and call themselves socialists right? They might look at the uh, Mao's uh, Chinese Cultural Revolution and think to themselves, this is exceedingly too far. This is sort of taking the project of communism and rendering it as adversarial to socialism, saying basically that the achievement of what would basically be a more modest socialistic form of political and social organization is not good enough. And so immediately you see that um, a lot of people will have a certain trepidation, right? And it almost separates the wheat from the chaff there is maybe one way to think about it. I don't know if you've thought about it in those terms, because I do see a lot of folks on the left um, look at it that way, or they look at it from the standpoint of the way in which the effects of the Chinese Cultural Revolution imported into France in particular, but other places in the West, and produce, for example, what Michel Kluskard calls the rise of libertarian liberalism. In other words, it, uh, the effects of this movement in the East s seeping into the 68 mm, uprising in the West produced a hyperliberalism, right? And um, I think that's a valid critique. I share that critique. While at the same time, on the first point, I also uh, consider myself in the tradition of Lenin. So I see, therefore, Mao as a great political strategist. And I don't see that gesture of Mao, that critique of Mao against socialism and the socialist factory, as necessarily um, excessive or false. Your thoughts? Well, I mean, that could branch us into a whole different discussion, which I'm not even sure uh, we'd have time for, which is liberalism, just because that whole idea that sort of this, you could say, dis Soviet dissident communist movements that are, came out of the Prague Spring, as you're alluding to, but also the Cultural Revolution, which is, of course, inspired in a very strange way, French communists who... We probably didn't know the extent of what was really going on at the time in China. But I would disagree with that characterization of ultra-liberalism just because I actually think it's more ultra-leftism 
So it's, it's more what Lenin would call yeah, ultra leftism, adventurism, left wing communism. Of course, he has his famous book, Left Wing Communism and Infantile, Infantile Disorder. I think that's more accurate because remember, like, liber as we know, liberalism is to the right of communism. But oh, sorry, I think uh, the, the point that I was making was you're right, ideologically. The those movements and thinkers that come out of May 68 thought, which we talk about a lot on my program, are better characterized as ultra leftists, etc. But the point that Michel Kluskard makes and others have made is that in principle, in substance, uh, they are they are aligned with the, the they have a non antagonistic relationship to left liberalism. That's the point. I'm not sure what the question was exactly. Well, the question was, let's go back to the beginning point. So Mao has this critique of socialism to, let's say, a critique of achieved socialism, right? He wants to go further than it. And a lot of people might say, why? <laughs> so could you maybe speak, let me rephrase it. Could you speak on behalf of Mao uh, for a moment and sort of make the case? Like, you see my point, like, why do we have to accelerate this process? Mm. What's, what is his thinking? Right, right. Yes. So Mao, he wanted to accelerate the building of communism, but he ended up accelerating capitalism, I would argue, but that's a whole different matter. I'm not the first to make that argument. Zizek in, de in defense of lost causes has a really interesting case as to why Mao and general, the whole principle of cultural revolution over economic revolution, something you deal with in your recent book on Nietzsche, actually has a certain homology with capitalism. It has a great affinity with it. And yeah, well, that, that's, that's certainly a more controversial claim to make. But to say Mao's case, right, which I think he had a lot of validity in. So Mao thought that the party became out of touch with the people. And of course, he develops very much earlier on before the Cultural Revolution, the idea of the mass line, the idea that you need the party still needs its role in guiding the revolution. You still need leadership. You can't have decentralized, disorganized forms of organization. But Mao thought the problem with the Soviet Union is this didn't really understand what the people want, what they were thinking and their concerns. So there was this democratic effort to really study the mass and to um, understand their concerns, then reapproach the mass again to see if those new proposals were appealing to them or met their needs. Now, I am clearly favorable to this idea. I think this is a really good idea. In fact, I actually think liberalism, liberal democracies, while having a largely undemocratic character in terms of sharing power with dominated classes, they actually perform a similar function with rights, the allowance mm -hmm. of, of the right to protest, the right to dissent, the right to criticize, freedom of speech. These are all methods in which the masses can express their sentiments, which the ruling order can sort of co-opt and integrate and change small things so that nothing else can be changed. In a sense, Mao is trying to do that, which is why anarchists are very suspect of Mao's sort of democracy. With Mao's case also was, of course, cultural in the Cultural Revolution. I deal with that in the essay, although I don't deal with it as much as mainstream depictions of the Cultural Revolution do, just because I think that's typically overemphasized. Mm -hmm. But Mao saw that while you can have a change in ownership, people might still behave in bourgeois ways, especially right. the party. So Mao was more right. concerned with the party, if anything. Contra to what mainstream depictions think, Mao wasn't concerned with really changing the minds of regular people. He had a, well, he was, but not, he, he thought that human nature was already in large part compatible with socialism, particularly the peasants who he regarded as a blank slate and less susceptible to bourgeois propaganda compared to people in the urban areas. This goes way back to Mao's strategy in the Long March. Now, the irony, of course, is that the people who were most steadfast to join the Cultural Revolution were students, who were his most ardent supporters. And he had Zhang Qing, his wife, a known actress, 
who espouse values, as you've pointed out in an article, very mm. contrary to the Cultural Revolution, mm. which is a very interesting contradiction there. But mm -hmm. he was able to use this influence sort of to get control over apparatuses of cultural production to get his right. message out. And he ended up getting control through People's Daily, a very complex power struggle, right? which I talk about in the video. So there is a cynical aspect, the Machiavellianism, which the Cultural Revolution does have. Let's make no mistakes. It is a power struggle, but that's not all that is. He does genuinely believe that the party forgets what socialism is all about. And there's this famous exchange between Mao and the party when a party member says socialism is the elevation of living standards. And Mao laughs at this idea. He scoffs at it. He thinks that's not all socialism is. And you know, I think he's right. If we go back to the foundational texts of Marxism, of course, there's much more to communism than that. However, it does highlight something in Mao's thinking, which is building communism in a way that is less cautious to potential risks in the depreciation of living standards. I'm not going to sit here and say that you know, Mao was wrong to do the Cultural Revolution because, I mean, he spoke to the concerns of people. People did feel alienated. They were confused why you, know, you had this new regime, but you had bureaucrats who were the new bosses telling them what to do. Some people would refer to these bureaucrats as little emperors. And a big slogan in the Cultural Revolution was, throw the emperor off his high horse. Right. Uh, off his horse. And uh, yeah, so that's sort of the case for Mao. I mean, it's very similar to a sort of Trotskyist critique of bureaucracy, but with the sort of anarchist trust in the masses to do communism themselves. Now, I'm not, to, right. I'm not rejecting that when I say I'm not, but I am saying that there is in Mao a belief that the bureaucrats are yeah. the problem and that the masses... There's, there's less of a problem there. Sure. And I think my view is that the Cultural Revolution showed that human nature, quote unquote, I prefer human behavior rather mm. than believing in the static human nature. While it's, I don't think it's a fixed thing, I think it's certainly shaped by our circumstances. And the author who you mentioned, Alessandro Russo, his sort of hypothesis is one of which I, I think is more of an optimistic one. He thinks that because China lived under states for so long that they... Inevitably, the people acted like states when they were mainly the Red Guards, right? Mm. Not like the people mm. in general, the Red Guards, who are the politicized section of the masses. Mm. They acted kind of like states when given this power, this right to rebel. Like, And you see it in the territorial uh, battles. They're literally fighting over territory, the Red Guard militias. And they were canceling each other, literally. They were dismissing each other from power, from the organization, and the same with that bureaucratic purges. Occur. So right. Rousseau thinks that Mao and the way the Chinese party behaved, as well as China's long history of living under kind of authoritarian states, it made it so that it was difficult for the Red Guards to behave in an egalitarian way, and they sort of emulated the statist behavior. Now, there's an implication in his work, he's not too overt about it, but he does imply that if the Cultural Revolution didn't begin as a set of top-down purges... And if it was from the start, a sort of bottom up phenomenon, maybe this wouldn't have happened. I doubt that just because I think humans evolve much slower than that. Mm. I think mm. we're quite slow to evolve. But I think the liberal wisdom in here is that there's checks against simply bad human impulses, which in the second video, I mentioned Nietzsche and weakness corrupts, not just power, powerlessness corrupts. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that. That's something Nietzsche talks about a throughout his work. I, of course, don't share the aristocratic politics that Nietzsche has, but I think there are these dark aspects of human behavior, not just within the powerful, but within the powerless. And the wisdom of liberals, right, is the utility of law, of checks and balances in regulating abuses of power. Now, what that looks like exactly, I think, is a discussion to be had. Yeah, added, added to which... Uh... There's a sort of disavowal or a major blind spot in liberals' um, reliance on law qua the free market, which uh, poses a, a fundamental mis misdirection of the how one corrects uh, an unruly situation. Liberals have an answer for that, which is different than because the communist answer is not the is not to throw people to the free market, so called. That's a side point. So let's go back to a couple points that you've raised. The first is the mass line. So if folks don't know 
probably next to the Bible, um, the, the, the Little Red Book, which was just simply a collection of quotations from Mao. Everyone can read it. I was just reading it recently. I've read it before. You should read it. There's a very fascinating uh, passage, I would say just a few, very close to the beginning of the book, about how, uh, to summarize, to paraphrase, Mao says, well, we know that in the United States, uh, the, the white proletariat, right, are manipulated by the elites, by the elite bourgeoisie, and that um, if they are, if they are basically, if they are capable of overcoming this manipulation, we, the U United States would have proletarian socialist politics. Uh, so I always found that to be an interesting point that Mao made, but everyone should read it. It's just these collections of like um, speeches that Mao gave and little excerpts and organized by categories of, of theme. And of course, one of the big reasons that the mass line becomes important is almost from a philosophical standpoint, a combination of, of a certain branch of empiricism, right? Which is uh, uh, guided by the logic, which is uh, no investigation, no right to speak on whatever matter it may be. And one of the things that's clear is when you do have a stultified bureaucracy in Mao's framework, in Mao's understanding of it, right? By stultified, I mean when uh, the class struggle freezes in a certain way, uh, when the proletarian investigation into their condition stops, you know, uh, it is in that context that you have emerged rightist deviationism or the re-entrenchment of bourgeois ideology, for example. Now, what I think is interesting about that phenomenon in the beginning of the Cultural Revolution in 1966-67 is the sense in which the how that uh, right deviationist or bourgeois ideology is, is handled, how those contradictions, because ultimately it is a loss of the coherence or of the clarity of the management of contradictions, which you could understand the management of contradictions at the very heart of what Maoism is, right? Where um, primary contradictions and secondary contradictions um, like are to be understood at a certain time, but there are also conditions and preconditions for the determination of, prop of the proper handling of contradictions, you see? That also is left up to the masses, that in some sense. And so you see Maoism, therefore, if you understand it, is to be understood as a comprehensive uh, philosophical strategy for the treatment of the class struggle at any given conjuncture. Now, one of the interesting things about the Cultural Revolution is that they're handling these contradictions in the sphere of the superstructure in a lot of ways, i.e., in the domain of uh, society and culture. And so immediately in that domain, you are handling contradictions of deviation, of bourgeois ideology, uh, detethered from, well, from material labor concerns in some cases. And that also, because Mao is simultaneously encouraging this handling um, by the Red Guards, which Rousseau makes an interesting point, by the way, that it is largely sociologically not yet clear the class composition of the Red Guards. In other words, what motivated the ideological fervor and excesses of the Red Guard in their sensorial and persecutory is not reducible, say, to the category of them being petty bourgeois. Because you see, it would be nice if we could say, well, in the West, and we often do say this as Marxists, right, that the problem of a particular form of left-wing politics has to do with the class position of the intellectuals that propagate this politics. Here, for example, today we talk about this as the PMC problem on the left, for example. Well, you see what Alessandro Russo has pointed out, and I want your take on this, is that the question of the Red Guards was they were already a heterogeneous class collective. What's your take on that, by the way? I'm, I'm speaking generally, but now I'm giving you a precise question to, to take on.
It's a really good segue to actually one of the last themes of the second video I did on the culture revolution, which is class as a political category. This is another thing, another huge theme that has preoccupied my thinking lately. So let's go back to the dictatorship of the proletariat. So the assumption is, is that under the dictatorship of the proletariat, whether it is represented by a vanguard party composed of members of the proletariat and the peasantry, or whether it's without a vanguard party, whatever, because, you know, there's the anarchistic interpretations of Marx, of course. So the understanding of the dictatorship of the proletariat is basically that, well, we already live in a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, even if they're not necessarily in charge. So if you have a dictatorship of the proletariat, naturally, they will use what was created by the bourgeoisie and the means of production in their favor for their own class interests, etc., and they'll progress towards communism, socialism. The problem is, is, as in China, and not just in China, but in most Soviet countries, that just didn't happen. Now, you can, we can say many reasons why. There's plenty of theories, disagreements. You know, there's the Stalinist theory of revisionism that started under Khrushchev. But the idea, right, is the assumption that because the proletariat is the uh, class in charge, that they will necessarily progress towards communism. Now, that didn't happen for a few reasons. So the class composition of the party was largely proletarian. And this is something we take for granted. Uh, Deng Xiaoping, Liu Shaoxi, uh, these members who were the right wing of the Chinese Communist Party who supported a form of capitalism in the transitionary period to have development you know, before China was developed for socialism and, well, for communism. <laughs> What socialism is for Marxists, as we know, it's a very muddy category. But essentially, the counter-revolutionaries, as Mao understood them, the revisionists, the rightists, were proletarians. Now, something interesting, now this is related to what you directly asked about the class composition of the Red Guards. They were, they were proletarians like by like origin, I guess, because they're bureaucrats origin. now, so technically they're not technically, but that's not how you're framing it. Yeah, I don't consider bureaucrats a class, but a social category. Uh, but that's a different, you know, debate. <laughs> of course, Mar there's many theories of classes. There are Marxists. But with uh, regard to the class composition of the Red Guards, they were the conservative Red Guards and the more radical one. The conservative ones were mobilized by Liu Shaoxi and people of the right wing of the Chinese Communist Party, who, rem let's remember, were actually the people in charge. Mao was, at this time, the spiritual leader of China. He wasn't like a dictator with absolute power. He just had an insane level of popularity, huge cult of personality, which he was able to leverage to, to inspire rebellions, much of which people already wanted to do. They were waiting. There was all this energy, all this fervor there. He just kind of unleashed it. Now, the conservative Red Guards, what's interesting, usually came from more proletarian backgrounds. So in China, in liberated China, after the Communist Party took power and firmly consolidated it, people of prior of proletarian origins, peasant origins, were favored in jobs, in universities, whether you could become a member of the party. Whereas people who came from bourgeois origins, family lineage, they were essentially the new discriminated class. Now that sounds kind of ridiculous. Oh, poor guy is discriminated. But the irony, right, is that in the Cultural Revolution, the conservative Red Guards, the ones who were mobilized by Liao Shaoxi, the ones who were sort of against these radical breaks from the party, establishing things like the Shanghai Commune, establishing things like organizations that are autonomous or semi-autonomous at the very least from the party state. The conservative Red Guards were all about obeying the party and you know order. Now, the radical Red Guards are often comprised of people who had you know, petty bourgeoisie, bourgeoisie family lineage, but who were sort of, I don't want to say a press class, but a discriminated class or set of people in the new society. So they love this call to rebel, whereas the people who are in a more comfortable position were less. So this, this exposes sort of contradictions in the assumption of the dictatorship of the proletariat, where you see actually a lot of people from pro proletarian origins taking a conservative position, a dangest position that we know today. So let me let me stop and, you there and ask you. Right. Let me just ask you: Can you do like a quick psychological interpretation of that? Like, what is the basic 
conclusion. And I, I know that it's speculative. I mean, I know like there's many interpretations of this, but what is your, I don't know, like pop psychology, like what, <laughs> what do you think that says? I think part of it is not so difficult to understand. At this time, real class distinctions were pretty much abolished. You had class distinctions in the sense of bureaucrats, I guess, if you want to consider that, the educated and the non-educated, the intellectuals and the peasants. You did have pe yeah, peasants, proletarians, but you didn't have like huge wealth differences or anything like that. That's all over at this time. They already, they already done away with that. So, you know, you have this class of people who are trying to integrate in society who might have came from bourgeois origins. You have a class identity politics, essentially, going on here. And it seems like it's fair, right? The people who are the poorest get the privileged position. That's fair in principle, I think. However, let's not assume that just because they're from the poor origins that they're going to necessarily support a transition to communism. Because as you pointed out, bureaucrats, they have a privilege, of course, over people who are not, and also people who are in the universities who have better career prospects, they're in more couchy positions. They're, they're less likely to be all gung-ho about radical experiments in communism. They're kind of thinking, okay, we're transitioning. I like the way things are. Let's just keep it as it is, some development. But the people who are maybe the students who are previously from lesser, from more privileged backgrounds, they're like, I don't have any privileges anymore. I have nothing to lose. I'm going to go uh, rebel. So that, that's, there's a basic psychology there. I think there's also another psychology when it comes to the oppression between people of the Cultural Revolution. But that's a, I don't know if that's part of the question you're at. You're, no, please, please uh, go ahead and uh, elaborate on that, please. Okay, because the class distinction, is, I think that's one psychology, and that's not too difficult to understand. It's pretty... Sure. But it's not evident when we consider the dictatorship of the proletariat, which, by the way, I'm not thinking we should throw this away. I'm not for making such conclusions. I don't take that position. But I do think the dictatorship of the proletariat has uh, serious flaws in its assumptions, and that I don't think the dictatorship of the proletariat necessarily leads to socialism. We should not assume that whatsoever. It's always... I think the transition to socialism and the new form is always a political act. It's not an economic act. So the core, core argument there is that class is an economic category, a socioeconomic category, but it's not a political category, meaning that how people are, their class positions and their class origins, even, even less so, are not predictive of their politics in an obvious way. They aren't. And it seems like they would be, but they aren't. And we know this just yeah. from today, the fact that, you know... I just want to say something very quickly about this. It also raises the question of what we call voluntarism. Mm. So what do I mean by that? Well, one way to think about the problem of voluntarism is to reference a l experience that I once had sitting in a lecture given by the philosopher Alain Bedju, who Bruno Bostils, who's been on my show, calls a post-Maoist. And he said something super interesting once, and I want your take on this because it's related. We won't lose the thread, don't worry. He said, May 68 in France, the uprising of the students and the workers in the factories occurred at a time in which capitalism had zero crisis and was functioning fine. May 68 in France, therefore, was a um, uprising that was successful based on the organization that occurred that brought it about in this sense. Like it was, in that sense, the objective conditions of the system of capitalism, right? I mean, he really sounds like how Gramsci appraised the Bolsheviks, right? When Gramsci called the Bolshevik uprising of 1917, the revolution against Marx's capital. So you see, uh, in an unabashed sense, Badju will then say yes. And this is actually genealogically, historically, the line of like where Rousseau connects to Marx and that there is a voluntarist strain in Marxism. That's actually an interesting thing is to be an unabashed Marxist voluntarist. Uh, because you're right. Class experience does not translate to a homogeneous or predictable form of politicization. As I say in my Nietzsche book recently, you may, I think you may have read this section of it. Well, 
from the standpoint of Nietzsche's vitalism and his will to power, uh, the working class is so far from that. So any vulgar Marxist idea that the working class is somehow, by virtue of its exploitation, going to have a voluntarist or be primed, right, for politicization by virtue of that exploitation that they experience is not necessarily true. But, but, and this is a big but, uh, that doesn't mean that education, right, cannot occur which would allow for politicization to occur in a certain way for that class experience. So you see my point. I don't want to say that there's some kind of spontaneous, natural uh, form of consciousness that occurs by virtue of the exploitation of class that then leads to politics. I think you're totally right. It's actually party mediation. It's like, like that, and Lenin knew this too. So it's not total like voluntarism like that. It's it's a sort of voluntarism combined with uh, a Marxism that puts a focus on political education and political organization. That's how I would see it. And I'm, I know I'm saying things in general, but please now I invite you to go back to what you were saying. Yeah, I'm sure, as, as you know very well, your mentor Alain Badiou writes plenty about this in politics. Uh, can politics be thought? He uh, identifies Lenin's What is to be Done as his favorite text of Lenin because that's where he sort of critiques economism and does, as you just mentioned, kind of put forth a voluntaristic view of politics. I mean, to describe it in a very vulgar way, I mean, I've always seen Lenin as one who sees that you need to grab history by the balls. You need to intervene history in history. And uh, it's why I like Ellen Badiou as a contributor to Marxism. I don't like, I, I, I'm very skeptical of a lot of uh, things in his politics, but I like his view of what politics is which is an intervention in history. And that's, he sees that in Mao. He sees Mao thinking that we need to intervene in, in history to uh, establish communism. It's not just going to happen. It's not inevitable. Mao, very early on, thought communism wasn't inevitable. You can see it in his writings and on practice and contradiction, contradictions among the people. And in Lenin, what is to be done, which probably the most boring to read text, but it's probably, I think, his most important text as to what Leninism is. What is to be done? I know it's as a side point. It's so interesting because that that really has big implications for what Mao Maoism is. Because to me, it's a total break from mechanical mechanical or reductionist Stalinism, and it's also a total break from some kind of vulgar teleology of Marxism. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, Mao is a real innovator. Like like it or not, like he's a serious contributor to the tradition of Marxist practice, without question. Certainly, yeah. And uh, well, some people might be confused at just those terms there, Stalinist. I do think he's more of a break from Stalinism than he is from Leninism. He is only a break from Leninism insofar as, I guess, trusting the masses more and uh, being much more critical of the party form. But he's breaks from Stalinism in the, in the sense that Stalin does reinforce a sort of teleology and that's just obvious if you read Stalin's work. I mean, historical and dialectical materialism, it's very teleological. As to how this originates, whether Mao, Marx himself was a voluntarist, of course, is a huge never-ending debate. My take on it is that there are elements of voluntarism and teleology in Marx, but I would say Engels, it's much more unequivocally teleological compared to Marx, and that's the little difference between them, but that's just, that's just my sort of impression. I mean, uh, whenever you say that Mao breaks from Lenin, it's true, but it's also true that um, the historical um, sweep of the communist movement had taken, sort of used the football metaphor, taken the ball down the field mm -hmm. to places where Lenin had never encountered. So we, we don't know uh, what Lenin would think about Mao's experimentation in the process of a communist revolution at the point that uh, that he had uh, experienced it. Right, yeah. I guess maybe to go a little bit back to the point in which About you're the on... Po politics the and class. Yes. Yeah, please. So I'll bring it to a theme in which you're very familiar with. Nietzsche, and I'm hugely influenced by Nietzsche. And one thing I, I really agree with 
your thesis in your book is you don't try to say we shouldn't read Nietzsche because of his background, but we should read him being aware of his background and what his real politics were. And I, I like this view of taking some of Nietzsche's wisest insights and almost turning them against him, against what he would have wanted. Now, we might disagree as to whether these, in, these assumptions of Nietzsche are true, but one thing about Nietzsche that I think is true is some of his insights regarding human psychology and power. And this is a reoccurring theme. The quote I use in the second video, which is, those who are impotent essentially often have a greater thirst for power, or that thirst for power, rather, is often comes from a sense of impotence, and you want to, you'll have a greater thirst for it. That doesn't mean you'll get it, because that's up on the will, right? And you could deal with this thirst for power through slave morality. I actually got that quote from Byung Chul Han's book, What is Power? I think actually his best book, uh, The Philosopher Byung Chul Han, What is Power? I think this is important because we're used to saying absolute power corrupts absolutely. And as a result, we tend to view people with power, bad. People without power, good. The meek shall inherit the earth. I, this is a critique that resonated with me just because I've known tons of leftists throughout my life, and a lot of them can be just as horrible human beings as right-wingers, despite me having more agreement with them. I think all humans are susceptible to nasty things. We're not perfect creatures. There's all sort of examples of why powerlessness can produce more dangerous subjects. Powerlessness corrupts. It's not just, you know, when you get power, you'll be corrupted. I think power is a test, yes, of your nobility, certainly. But not all powerful people act horribly, but many do, right? Uh, it requires great responsibility. Now, we actually already have so much common wisdom about this, that powerlessness corrupts, but it's not obvious. I'll give an example. Napoleon complex. You know, there's a stereotype that shorter people tend to be angrier and more bitter and lash out. And I mean, it makes sense. Impotence can produce a, a sort of anger. I think it is actually a quite poignant critique. I've sure. mentioned this before. But the point here being is that this Nietzschean insight into power and how it can really destroy someone's psyche. And I mean, of course... Nietzsche's own life is a reflection of this. He was an incredibly impotent man. He was very sick, had a weak body. And his writing, becoming a great philosopher, was sort of his way of achieving a sense of power, right? Now, he thought everyone had a will to power to some extent. And that if we didn't actually pursue our will to power individually or collectively, right? He has all these instances where he praises the Jews in a kind of weirdly somewhat anti-Semitic way, where he buys into the tropes of Jewish people in, in finance, but then he says, look at them, they, they had a will to power and collectively using their isolation, their subjugation for their own benefit. And he kind of praises that. And there's a certain aspect to Nietzsche. He respects those who pursue a will to power collectively or individually. And he hates people the most who have a slave morality. He'll say, um, they'll say, well, the powerful people they're actually bad because they're powerful or what they have is bad. And me being a gracious person who doesn't pursue such terrible Machiavellian things, I am good because of that, you know? And he, he detests Christianity for that. Now he thinks this empowers the mass. I think actually that slave morality does disempower the mass. It's in our, in our views on nonviolence, turn the other cheek, be the better person. Revolution is always seen as bad because, you know, it's immoral and that's what the bad people do. But it's also in a revolutionary setting irrelevant, right? Because how, how do you account for the psychology of so much of the petty infighting, the fact that what it was a communist cause, the Cultural Revolution, was just weaponized as a guise by many people to rationalize interpersonal feuds, petty beefs. You know, if you had a teacher you didn't like, you could call him bourgeois and have him wear a dunce cap and be paraded in the streets. If you, there's a person simply that people wanted to bully, they could use that as an excuse. People can be very petty. We forget this as, you know, leftists, we want to think, oh, human nature is fine in structures that are... Now, this is something that I don't think makes communism impossible. But what it does entail, right, is that there should be checks on the powerless as well as the powerful. And that the liberals understood this, and, but they had a very different project, of course, for pre preserving bourgeois society. But a lot of liberals, particularly the elitist tradition of liberals, 
I consider the elitist tradition of liberals to be John Stuart Mill and Alexis de Tocqueville and some others, Locke too, but some would disagree because some people view John Stuart Mill as a radical liberal, and he is because he supports socialism, emancipation of women. He is one of the most progressive, but he is an elitist in the sense that he is skeptical of the tyranny of the majority and stuff like that. I used to dismiss this all the time. I am a skeptic of human nature, but I think it can be changed because it has changed. It has mm -hmm. evolved. That's, I think that there's a, a materialist view on human nature would see that can be changed, but slowly. As yeah. opposed to, I think, you know, Chomsky is very overt about believing human nature is like this inherent good and right. anarchists tend to view this. I'm skeptical. I mean, if you look at people who are some of the most nasty to each other, look at schools, elementary schools. Well, I think school. this is really interesting. I mean, I would bring it back to the political, a question on political affects in a certain way. It might be one way for us to gain a foothold here. And Marx, and then later, um, obviously, Franz Fanon, will both uh, put a big onus um, on the question of political change vis-a-vis -vis the affect of political shame, right? And Marx even somewhere, I think when dealing with the national question, says something about how um, like a, a class struggle doesn't occur until you have the uh, expansion of, of, sh of shame, right? People need to, and, and you know, and shame and humiliation, um, shame is not humiliation, but um, shame can also be understood as synonymous with modesty. So w therefore, one of the effects of being shamed, of being humiliated, I would say is twofold. On the one hand, it gives you a resolve because it presents an internal feeling of something which you've gone through where you are physically vulnerable and exposed. On the other hand, when you are physically vulnerable and exposed, you feel that you have not had a fair trial. You've been persecuted unjustly. And that feeling of perse being persecuted unjustly can actually produce a certain inner strength inside of you. And that actually goes back for me to a certain argument that I make, which you're familiar with, which is that political affects of liberalism, and Nietzsche, and Nietzsche is a great hyper-liberal, um, one of the best, uh, a, who must be included in your tradition, by the way, of elite liberals, um, knew very well that the problem was the activation of political resentments. So I think the question that we're dealing with here revolves around how we allow for the venting and the expression of political resentments and how we manage the uh, experience of being shamed in a certain way because it's a powerful political motivator, right? And I think we all have probably personal anecdotes that we can recall from our lives, especially living in after Donald Trump came to power, of the weaponization of political shaming and humiliation rituals, which we ourselves are going through, obviously in a liberal context, unfortunately. Uh, because they are valuable and they do produce a certain effect, right? They produce a certain frustration as well. And I think one of the things we're experiencing right now in our culture is the limit point, the dead end, the wall of the efficacy of these hyper-liberal forms of shaming that have emerged since Donald Trump came to power. They clearly are not producing a form of politics that is capable of, of facilitating what we as socialists want, which is a, a material transformation in uh, a mode of production which allows for the continual immiseration of people, right? So in that sense, I think uh, all of this stuff is very pertinent, obviously, right? And I think what you're saying about the, the, the point about class vis-a-vis -vis economic versus political, I want to return to that. And I want to invite you to say a little bit more about that, um, if you would. Because I think it's one of the big, biggest insights of your second video. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one of the big lessons that the Cultural Revolution gives to us, right? And, um, and I, I, want, I want you to say more about that. And then I want to move to a conversation about the, um, like, like, let's call it the reverberations or the, um, the, um, the impact that the Cultural Revolution has had in the West. I want to focus on that next. But say a little bit more about class uh, and its lessons. Uh, if you would, because I feel like that was, you had more to say there. 
Right. Well, actually, I have most to say about your term liberal and its relevance to this whole conversation, the, use, the way you use liberal, because I think this is where we might have a disagreement. Um, but I will say first answer your question, because I think it's actually, there's, there's a quick answer to this, which is class is undeniably a hugely important economic category. It's a socioeconomic category, which has, if anything, been left out too much by left movements, especially in academia. There's been a retreat from class, as a, a certain author named Ellen Wood has written about. Many people have written about this. I think there's a, now a return of class politics. It's happening. But class politics, I think, is actually kind of a contradiction in terms. Class is an economic basis, and it's a basis of our politics, right? It is something in which a lot of people have in common, being dominated. I tend to use the term, if you notice, dominated and dominant classes throughout my work, even in other articles I've written. One article I've written on uh, Nikos Polansis that is on Cosmonaut, he uh, uses those terms dominated and dominant class because the word proletariat, when put to scrutiny, is a very difficult term, especially in today's world where with a gigafied economy. Class politics just you can't be copied and pasted from Marx's time to today. But I think at the crux of it, right, is there's the people who are getting the shitty end of the stick and the people who are getting the better end of the stick. And it's a power relation at the end of the day. The dominant classes, the dominated classes. So the a politics of communism is a politics that is for the emancipation of the dominated classes. Now, I think there's people who are sort of in this weird midpoint, right? Like the PMC, professional managerial class, who you know some might debate as even a class or just a social category. But they're in this weird midpoint sort of like the petite bourgeoisie who are dominated, but also dominate others. Now, class can be a basis of solidarity, but it is in itself not a predictor of what politics is. What a politics is, I think, is a radically subjective thing. It is, you know, I do agree with Badu that it ultimately is thought. The title of his book, Can Politics Be Thought? You know, of course, is play on words with, can we think of politics? But literally, can politics be thought itself? Marxism is this very unique political ideology, if you want to call it that, because it is a theory of everything and a theory of politics. It's a descriptive theory of the world that, that tries to objectively determine its own politics. So like politics that Marxism espouses is a consequence of its description of the material world. It's supposed to just arrive naturally, but we know that this is not true, Right. What happened when in the Russian Revolution was the SRs took power, and then it was up to the Bolsheviks to seize the moment of the fact that they were still in the war. They could use that. They chose that movement. It was a choice. And what the Bolsheviks sought to Im implement was a th it's in consciousness. It gets materialized in the real world, but it emerges as consciousness. So I think that's what politics is. It's an intervention in history. So that's sort of the lesson there is Class is important, but it's not everything. And a lot of the neo-Stalinists today, which you know, I say neo-Stalinists because there's this weird trend, as I'm sure as you've noticed, of people with Stalin avatars, and they call themselves Marxist-Leninist, usually anti-revisionists. But then there's some of them support China, which is kind of strange because that contradicts their whole thing. But they will usually say that the reason why actually existing socialism failed was because of Khrushchev, and Khrushchev. He thought class conflict was over and that you just mm -hmm. had to build. They were in low phase communism and they had to go to high phase. Now, the irony of that is Stalin also thought that classes were abolished and he stayed of the poor people. That starts with Stalin too, but I don't think that has anything to do with it. I don't even think bureaucrats were the problem. It's the type of bureaucracy and it's the how mm. they're held accountable, what they're doing. The complaints of, of most people who lived in communist countries that I've met and you know the critiques that you hear were never that there wasn't enough class struggle. What people often say is, well, I had to wait in line for eggs every day. Right. Or I couldn't say what I thought because the Stasi was at my door. I mean, a good movie about this is The Lives of Others. It's about the DDR. Actually, I'm a quarter German, and my mother knew people who lived in the East at the time, in the East Berlin. She knew people after the war fell, but who they lived in East Berlin. And a common thing was that you know, a lot of the, what was in socialism was great. I mean, we had a home, we had a job, it was easy to have kids, yet a lot of things were better. 
But mm. people complain about the fact that everyone was snitching on each other because everyone mm. one would have, there was an incentive due to the police state, the insane police state, which had no accountability whatsoever. Mm. People would often rat on each other to the Stasi. Right. The Stasi would be constantly looking, looking right. for people who did stuff wrong. People hated this. They also hated the fact that, you know, what was a lot of promises of socialism, having better living standards, alleviation of poverty, some of that was lacking, as they thought, uh, compared to the West. And a lot I, of that, a lot of that was lacking, though, because of of Western imperialism at their yes. doorstep. And and yeah. I mean, this is one of the things that people That's don't true. understand uh, when they appraise what happened in Russia. Well, I mean, to understand the the multiple wars that were brought to the doorstep of the Bolsheviks, precisely mm -hmm. because of their success. And I think the other thing I just wanted to say very quickly is that a lot of these problems in the Stalinist um, area uh, really occurred, I think, be from a theoretical standpoint, due to the moralization of class as a political category. And, and what I mean by that is like, um, I think it's valid, right, today to have a class-centered politics that is like, yeah, I want to overcome class relations in the in this particular oppressive and exploitative mode. Like that's valid. Um, the problem becomes when one renders their understanding of the identity and the experience of the working class as the agent that you want to over overcome or liberate, right? And then you see a problem that we saw here in in Mao's context, which was um at what point does it stop? At what point does the revolution, which is meant to ameliorate a particular form of suffering, um, detether itself, right, from the prior structures of revenge and structures of um, humiliation that define the society? Like, for example, if we have a revolution, the working class comes out on top, and all of the shame and humiliation rituals are then pushed down to a class that was formerly the dominators. My question is like, okay, how many generations of former bourgeois need to be humiliated before they learn? And then we fall into racism because we have rendered our understanding of class as a race. In so far as, well, yeah, yeah, we're talking about the paternity going back generations, and you need to pay for what your grandfather did. That sounds like what liberals do, right? Right. This is not well, what I would say when you use as liberals, I just use the word progressives because I think it's actually okay. We we have a disagreement on liberals, but I mean, right. I think that's mm -hmm. another conversation we can have. Yeah. But you know, that's fine. Sure. But it, absolutely, I mean, yeah, you have this kind of new trend and ra race guilt and and all of that and all, all this sort of politics. And to be fair, Mao himself was critical of bloodline theory, which is what you're referring to, this idea that if your uh, uncle owned a, owned a factory back in the old regime, you shouldn't have the opportunity to go to university and get a good job or even be in the party like someone who was oppressed and struggled with. Mao was critical of this, but Mao himself gave way to this. Mao was such a pioneer of this politics with his five black categories. And you see this with uh, Stalin weaponizing the word kul kulak became a originally a kind of semi-sound category to being just an ideology, a consciousness. Right. Yeah, you could have Kulak consciousness, and you just use that really for administrative ends to justify- Well, I mean, it's, it's the same thing since, you know, we're having a, this is a wonderful conversation, by the way. I mean, it's similar to a certain vulgar reading even of Hegel's, uh, Hegel's reflections on work, right? I think we should never forget, form the rudiments, of the presupposition that informed a lot of communist ideas that the correction of bourgeois ideology could be solved by introducing people to manual labor. Now that's an interesting thing that people should study because I think I do think that m the experience of manual labor doesn't produce necessarily like clear moral effects, but within the class relation, I think actually like they, they could produce effects which could be beneficial. But the problem is, is the extent to which you're going there when it becomes this 
penalistic, excessive punishment structure, right? Talk about Nietzsche. Like I think to his credit, Nietzsche would be opposed to something like that to some extent of this kind of like excessive punishment qua, like, you know, the gulags structure. Mm -hmm. But still, nonetheless, there's a kernel of truth to it. You know, there's definitely a kernel of truth. Like I would love nothing more than to send the Republican members of Congress. Uh, I would I would love nothing more to have them just purely exist on minimum wage. May sound like a liberal demand, but like I'd love to see it. Yeah, you know? I mean that all that all happened. And in certain in the case of Stalin, it was much more horrific. But you know, in the case of Mao, you could say at the start definitely over persecution for sure. But I mean, anyone who's seen the movie Last Emperor of China about the young Emperor Puyi, he he actually is put into a in a sort of gulag. But he's also reformed. There was this effort of rehabilitation in the uh, communist regime of, of China, and uh, he ended up becoming a, a good contributor to this society. And uh, you know, you could like a communist, you know, debatable how much he believed in it. But I mean, he he became redeemed. He was pr actually praised for that. So I think there's plenty of great cases. I'm not against. You know, I think yes, there are many people who have done plenty of crimes who should be sent to gulags. Of course, gulag is just a prison that I. My view of prison is the same way I view like how gulag should be, which is a process of rehabilitation, and yeah, that will involve some manual labor, of course. You know, like a, to be against that is just silly. Even prison abolitionists, they kind of just want to replace it with Norwegian prisons a lot of the time, right? So I'm not under any delusion when it comes to the need that some people certainly do need to be persecuted, like in any regime. But class politics, right, is sort of it doesn't tell us much about anything of what the politics is. We call our current regimes that we live in the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, but when the founding fathers were forming their society, they were like, yeah, we want to preserve our property, our slaves, but they were disagreeing about what does that look like and what that looks like, so what that regime is, how is it stable? That's the political questions, not the class questions. The class questions are who is it for, for whom? But there isn't really any definitive structure of what a capitalist political system is. The idea of a, some people say our Political system is capitalism. I mean, it's just not a You can have a dictatorship. You can have all sort of different types of capitalism. I think the parliamentary one is the most common for a reason, because it's best at representing the different interests of capitalists. Yeah, I mean, I would I would characterize our um, the power that operates in the United States as structured on entrepreneurial, liberal, meritocratic capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I agree with... Um, uh, Capitalism Alone by um, the uh, Bronco, I forget his last name. Uh, it's a great book called Capitalism Alone, where where he really says, yeah, I mean, in in today's in today's world, there's there's authoritarian um, Eastern version of capitalism vis-a-vis -vis China, and then there is a, what he calls Rawlsian meritocratic capitalism, and that's ours, right? And in that Rawlsian. scenario. Well, he says opinion. Rawls. He says Rawls uh, is the predominant philosopher of the liberal meritocratic capitalism, which, after the 1990s, became um, ideologically hegemonic vis-a-vis -vis what they call third-way liberalism, Clintonism, um, and and um, Tony Blair, and so on, which then um, kind of took the wand from Reaganism. And right, and now we're mm -hmm. in the kind of wake of the collapse of, and Obamaism is obviously an extension of that, but it's guiding, it's guiding ideology is the, um, is the allowance or the assurance of, with as much degree as possible, of every citizen to. This is what they call liberal egalitarianism, right? Because like Rawls has his own version of egalitarianism, but it's an egalitarianism around. Um, helping to ensure the possibility of each citizen to be in a place to maximize their entrepreneurial to to like the idea is like you know that's why it's Rawlsian to create just a modicum of equality not too much just a slight modicum to allow people to be in a position to enter into a competitive relationship to the free market and I think that our, our system is kind of geared towards that. But I think also that after 2008, we have major, major blind spots about bringing people to that form of equality, which is why I believe 
that one of the major tasks of socialism in the West is a serious reinterrogation of equality because we have this huge portion of our society, like for example, the 50% of people that don't have a college education, right? Um, who just simply don't have a, a leg up in that social order. So that's how I would characterize our, I don't know if you agree with that gen in general, maybe you, maybe you disagree. I don't agree with the characterization of roles. I'm not a Rawlsian, but that's just another conversation. I mean, probably should have Matt McManus on for that. But uh, yeah, I think with regard to equality, I'm in this regard, actually probably like orthodox Marxist in, in this question, because I think equality isn't really the basis of Marxism. Now, what, the, what does a Marxist mean politically is a big question. You know, like what Marxism is, is a descriptive theory versus what it is as a prescriptive theory, almost two different things, but connected. But first of all, why do I even adopt Marxism at all in my arsenal? What do I identify with it in some sense? And I mean, it's because Marxism to me was one of the, well, it was the only form of socialism that I thought had a rigorous approach to understanding what it wanted to change and how to change it. And what's interesting about Marxism is that the basis of, of it, or I mean for Marx, Engels, and Lenin, all, all of whom are very direct about this, equality is not the basis of what they're doing. They think equality is sort of like an idealist concept. Because, I mean, what does it really mean? So why would you want equal, like equality of outcome? Of course not. And of course, people like Jordan Peterson, right-wing critics like to say that communists believe in equality of outcome. And I mean, it makes sense why people would oppose that. But I mean, you know my position on this pretty well after ready, reading my, my work on this. My conception is that um, liberalism has a theory of equality that we live with day in and day out, which is oppressive and repressive. I call it repressive egalitarianism. I get it from Christopher Lash, right? And I simply believe that one of our tasks, philosophically, intellectually, theoretically, whatever have you, in, you know, in Marx's critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, what does he say about revolutionary theory? He says, theory doesn't mean anything until it is seized by the masses. As such, the masses need a new theory of equality, okay? They need to yearn for it. It's a question of desire. It's a question of desire. Okay, bourgeois uh, social order can convince us of a certain theory of equality, and it can convince us that equality is good for nothing. I think proletarian politics should be about cultivating a new desire for a form of equality, which we don't have available to us in this world. That's my simple take. We can, I mean, it's, I, I know actually, we're talking actually, about a lot. But... I actually disagree. I actually think the answer is already in early liberalism. Like, I think they have a theory of equality. Like, you know, ha this isn't a Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau. How they how it manifests is very different. But and of course, you know, there's a racial component. But even that is is you know complex because even the early founders actually believed slavery would be abolished eventually. And so the idea of equality as rights, as you know, you you all should have an you should have an equality of opportunity. You have the rights of every citizen. I think that's like at a material level, guaranteeable. Where and but it's not always in practice, and that that's why Marx's critique of bourgeois society centers around the real contradictions in a bourgeois society in crisis, and the fact that you don't have. What is the promise is not realizable, and we all know this too well. Like the legal system, you can buy your you can buy your way, you know, out of crime. Whereas if you're uh, there's all the discrimination of class, sure. race, and in, in the justice sure. system. What what I think with so what I mean like this new idea of equality, I think it's just a realization of the bourgeois ideal, and Marxism wants to uh, achieve that through the uh, economic emancipation. But go beyond that, and that's why I think, you know, to each according to their ability, to each according to their need. And for me, what I see, the project of communism, rather than equality, is the, is the emancipation of the horizon of human potentiality. And what I would use that maybe in a more broader sense is just simply human evolution. Evolution of the sure. human species, if you want to put it in Darwinian terms. But what, where I see that is because, you know, th you have recently did a reading group on the young Marx. He talks about mm -hmm. as early as then about the emancipation of the human faculties, mm -hmm. the, the potential to use basic things like reason, the potential to actually utilize our species being, which is, you know, what makes us really human, which is all kind of 
stultified under capitalism. Well, let me let me explain it. Let me explain it by linking it back to our debate about the or not our debate, but our discussion on the cultural revolution. Right. For me, unless a certain form of class consciousness qua equality is developed in the sequence of a socialist political process, unless that happens, I, what I fear, and I agree, I agree that the outcome I in that sequence is not a static affirmation of a certain form of Rousseauist equality. No, it comes earlier in order to arrive at the higher uh, ideal for Marx, which is freedom. I would characterize, I would put, I would put freedom over equality, but only, only dialectically speaking at a certain later sequence of the process of politics. The problem that we have today is the total absence of the desire for inequality that would be beyond the market sphere. I think that the market sphere is such a site of a certain profound domination and repression that people don't have the language or the concepts to speak to that oppression. And liberalism doesn't care to speak to that repression because they've rendered that market relation natural. So in that sense, we already know where equality can't, can't be hurt, right? We already know that. And I think socialism needs to make that make its voice elevated around that particular form of absent equality is what I would say. So I don't know that we necessarily agree because ultimately I don't think that socialism will work if it's based on some kind of uber transcendental equality that is then forced, precisely because if that happens, then I think you, you lead to a lot of these repressive scenarios that we're talking about, like in the, in the Cultural Revolution. But maybe, Tony, if we could in our, in our kind of closing time, if I could open up a field of reflection, and if there's anything undone that you want to say from before, you can. But here's my final question for you. In a, aside from the class question, the liberal question, and so on, um, can you speak about the effects of the Cultural Revolution as you see them in the arena of politics that we're from more, from more familiar with, in like the Anglo- um, European, uh, American context, like, um, how do you see the lasting symptoms maybe? Like if there's like undone symptoms, right? Like if you use the metaphor of psychoanalysis, like it's an unfinished, and people talk about Zizek is, he says so many weird things cause he never finished analysis. So therefore symptoms remain in some sense. I'll put it in that form. What are the unfinished symptoms? of the cultural revolution that still persist? Okay, I think you actually know the answer to this better than I do. But with the cultural revolution, one has to separate what Mao wanted to actually do versus the way it inspired movements. Because of course, Mao is all about challenging the party. But, but I mean, this did influence movements like the like Solidarity in Poland, for example. But really, the influence of the cultural revolution was the cultural aspect of this idea of you know, first you need to transform consciousness before you can transform the mode of production. And, uh, you know, this is, you're very critical of this and you think it's part and parcel kind of the Nietzscheanization of the left. I'm, I'm quite critical of it as well. And we, we see this in all sorts of elements, such as in ways that Mao would not even have imagined, like, well, culture wars, for example, right? There's, it was interesting to me when I listened to Judith Butler have an interview and she was asked why she endorsed Kamala Harris over Bernie Sanders. And she's, not, she's far from a stupid person. She's very educated on Marxism. All, she understands capitalism is bad. But she said very cynically that we're so far from changing capitalism. And if you can't have a black president or black vice president like Kamala Harris, then you know, forget capitalism. So there's this kind of idea that, that permeates a lot of the the new leftism, which is that you need to change consciousness. And I, I will be honest, one of my great intellectual heroes is totally guilty of this, Herbert Marcuse. In my book coming out at the end of November on what I call liberal totalitarianism, it's really about Sheldon Wool and U.S. democracy. Mm -hmm. I have a line where I say the irony is Marcuse's new sensibility became the new spirit of capitalism, mm. and of course. Marcuse is famous for this idea that we need a new sensibility. I think it's one of his more bad ideas, but and but there's some truth to it, which is this idea that you know we need to change consciousness. We need to go beyond one-dimensional thought, which you know his term is 
really what that means is capitalist realism, what we call capitalist realism today, one-dimensional thought, very similar things. He thinks this is like the alternative to that. You need to change consciousness. And as a result, you have all these sort of depoliticization of all these efforts to change culture before capitalism. And of course, capitalism is compatible with this. You, you write about this in your stuff on the family, right? Capitalism is actually kind of anti-tradition in many ways. Like tradition is an obstacle to that. Slavoj Žižek makes a very radical claim in, in defense of lost causes, his book, that the Cultural Revolution paved the way for Chinese super capitalism because by tearing down or by attempting to tear down all of these relics of China's feudal past or ancient past, like Confucianism, Buddhism, by trying to tear this down, literally and metaphorically, it actually kind of makes what is a radical change, and that is capitalism. Capitalism being, as Marx uh, said, all that is solid melts into the air. He called it the anarchy of the market. It tears down traditional social forms of organization, culture. It, it, it's the most, mm. at least exponential change. So he thought that the Cultural Revolution kind of produced the opposite of what it was supposed to produce. It kind of made capitalism easier. After so it is. Uh, can you hold that thought? I just want to say one thing. This connects back to your point on Judith Butler. I haven't seen that interview, but it's very interesting. And of course, I'm aware that uh, she made a big contribution to Kamala Harris's campaign. I didn't. I want to see that interview. Um, but it's interesting, though, because if you take this mode of analysis that you're articulating, well, then changing capitalism would ameliorate Judith Butler's worry, would it not? Which is that, yeah, there's a relationship between the anarchy of the market and the intensification of racism. Because one could understand the intensif intensification of racism as a feeling of being threatened of the removal of instability in one's life, as well as the removal of one's own traditional uh, sphere of comfort, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. But what's, what's doing that? <laughs> what's the cause of that? Right, it's a reaction to the kind of stratification of communities. It's a reaction to change, but it's, of course, they don't really know what is causing the change and why it is. And of course, race becomes an easy scapegoat. And it's why capitalism on, does this double thing where it kind of simultaneously accelerates racism, but also ameliorates it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It kind of does both at the same time. It's really strange. And we're in a, some sticky territory. I, I think you're a secret Straussian, Daniel. You know, I think in your book, you have a, a lot of points that we're both trying to make right now that are very hard to talk about on the left. And so <laughs> this is a, perhaps a departure from the cultural revolution, but I guess the point of that is this aspect of changing culture before you can change the material conditions. I mean, it hasn't worked so well for the left. I mean, and it's very compatible with capitalism. And uh, there's some yeah, authors yeah, yeah. who have argued that religion has held back capitalism. Now, that's, it would be a very idealistic argument then to go say, we need to bring back tradition to stop capitalism. Because, you, know, you know, this is where conservatives always fall short. Conservatives think you can bring back the ideas, but they forget the ideas why they're dissolving is partially due to a material right. condition. And what I think with communism is not that it'll necessarily help those prog regressive traditions. I think what will be inevitable and necessary under communism is just a new form of tradition, what I think a better right. tradition. And that remains to be seen. And I mean, it's been tried. The French Revolution tried it. It's, it's tradition, but it's also myth. And it's also political ideological myths. Like, for example, we all despise in an intellectual sphere, an intellectual sense, meritocracy. Because we know it's not really fair. We know it's not really true. But we have to live it. We're forced to live it as a, as a pragmatic disciplinary ideology. Like, it would be foolish to not do well for yourself in your career, would it not? It would be foolish to not try to get into a good school, would it not? So, one of the things that happened in this question of the socialist factory in 1966 in China was what they call the ideology of Sakonovism, which was the incorporation in the USSR, right? of forms of Protestant work ethic, right? The, how do you incorporate a collective sense of sacrifice 
for uh, the desire and energy of workers, right, to 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 actually function. Well, in the West, it's meritocracy, and it's like the logic of uh, the Three Musketeers, right? It's like this kind of anti-collectivist individualism, right? In a future communist society, it's not clear what political myths will orientate the people's desires. In Mar and Marxism doesn't have a ready-made one. It doesn't. You can say it's a Prometheanism. That's not really true. No, I think Bolshevism shows that every revolutionary sequence invents its own political myths. And um, that's that's why Nietzsche is such an important thinker for politics because Nietzsche knew about creating concepts as as myth. Like he knew about that, right? That political myths mean a lot. So that's another thing we can talk about in the future. And maybe I love talking to Tony because he's kind of like talking to a famous writer. Like I used to love the beats and um, the beats were interesting because they wrote about each other. And so you never know when you're talking to Tony, you're giving him an idea for a YouTube video that you may make at one point. And I'm always sending you things like, you should make a video about this. <laughs> but you'll choose. You're a very intelligent and uh, original person. Um, so this has been fabulous. Um, I told you in the beginning, we're just going to scratch the surface. But I, if anything, the objective of this conversation was to give people more ideas to think about and more things to read. Um, is there anything you want to say in closing, um, given we've been on for one hour and 49 minutes? Of course, yeah. I mean, probably there's not time for this, so I will say this would be Please. a great pretext to a future conversation, which would be that of the relation between communism and liberalism. Because I noticed the way you use liberalism is the way people today use liberalism, which is you know not inaccurate. I mean, you are describing contemporary liberalism. I just don't like the term because we kind of forget the illiberal ways that modern liberals are. Because I actually, frankly, think, Daniel, both of us are liberals in a certain sense, in the same sense that Marx was sort of a liberal, Lenin was a liberal, overcoming liberalism. And I say that because your reaction, for example, to different strange ideas, you recently had a debate with the, the streamer, Haz, Haz al Din Infrared, and your approach is to deal with contradictions by actually hashing them out, by directly confronting these ideas. I'm all for that. That's my approach. I'm against the people who think you just can get rid of problems by canceling people. I think that's not a liberal thing whatsoever. It's a, it's a highly Stalinist, but it's what Alessandro Russo, I can't believe I never used this term yet in this discussion, would call dismissal. Dismissal. And I right. mentioned this repeatedly in right. politics. Dismissal right. is this kind of bad human instinct, you could say, of kicking people out of an in-group due to right. whatever reason. And it's it's a pseudo-politics. You, you get rid of a problem by just you know, attacking individuals. It's this sort of individualist subjectivity. He, he calls it a state of subjectivity. I don't, I don't know if I agree with that term, but the it's this authoritarian subjectivity, a mini authoritarianism, where sure. people want to deal with the conversation by just kicking someone out. And there, some people have, you know, attacked you for even quote unquote platforming other people who are, you know, have problematic ideas and sort. I'm also a person who believes in discussion of ideas and you can't kill ideas by killing a person, metaphorically. So I think this is something all classical liberals, they dealt, yeah. with, they dealt with contradictions within their own class in a very right. civil manner. Like, I mean, Hamilton and Jefferson, they hated each other. They had views so opposed to each other, but they, you know, they both saw each other as they respected each other's right to disagreement, right? I think that's good. I think that's good. I mean, I think there are limits for me. Like, I probably would not debate a Bronze Age pervert, you know, somebody who says my politics are are fascist or worse. Mm -hmm. I mean, he makes it very clear uh, what his politics are. There's not really room for debate, but because they don't want to debate. Yeah, they don't really want to debate. But if they wanted to, but with Haas, uh, it's, it's slightly different. On the one hand. His he's fusing together highly incoherent things, which is based on full like a full intellectual choice of uh, kind of gluing things together, which are incoherent. On the one hand, on the other hand, to avoid the opportunity to talk to his base of of supporters, who if we call them all fascists just for following him, I think we lose the the weight and the significance of 
what fascism really means, precisely because it's very likely that Haas's movement will kind of crumble. Despite what some people may say, oh, I don't think mega communism is something we're going to be talking about in two years. I highly doubt it. See my point? So it's it's kind of goes back to the Judith Butler point, which is like, how do you appraise the subjectivity of a reactionary? Uh, that's a question for me. It's like this idea of appraising reactionary as almost like a immutable or intrinsic thing. Um, I'm opposed to that. And part of that is is uh, biographical because of where I come from. Like I mentioned, you know, you probably know, I come from a very conservative family. Most of my people would be considered reactionaries on the left, right? So anyways, I don't want to get into that, but thank you for that word. And I think we should definitely talk more about liberalism. And yeah, um, exit on and, note. yeah, no, this has been fabulous. And I, I wish you the best of luck. And um, I can't wait to see what you come up with next in terms of videos. And how can we find the book? Yeah, so the book will be coming out on Revil Press. Some people like Derek Varn, Mike Watson are writing on there. Some people who are formerly associated with back in the day was called Zero Books. Yeah. And yeah, that'll be coming out in November at the end of 2024 after the election cycle. Mm. So people probably forget when the, by the time they're listening to this. So I'd say in the, in the meantime, just give me a follow on Twitter and check out my videos. And if you're interested in long-form discussions, I also have a podcast called One Dime Radio where I interview all sort of people who I think are, have compelling things to say. I did a podcast with Daniel on his book. I think I was one of, I think I was one of the first people to interview you about your book on Nietzsche. So yeah, go check that out. It's called One Dime Radio with the number one D-I-M-E. You'll find it in the description, I assume. And if you want to support my work financially, because as we know, your ability to create heavily, heavily depends on your OTM and your OTM depends on your money. So feel free to support me on Patreon if, if you have the means. So yeah, that's it. Um, I look forward to our discussions on liberalism and first progressivism in the future. All right. Thanks everybody for watching. Thanks for coming on, Tony. Take care.